Welcome to Myth and Mission. This is our last study session on this series, but it is not our last hope. Please, Commander, you are our last hope. The theme here is hope, indeed. So, what am I talking about? Well, when I drew this up, I originally meant that we would look at the end of these stories, right? We looked at the origin point of these stories, the Enuma Elish, uh, some of these ancient Near Eastern comparatives, and then we looked and contrasted how different the Bible began. And what I wanted to do was contrast how differently the, the end game of these religious texts are. And I realized I actually have done that in a previous study session called Meta Narrative and our Eschatology 101 series. So if anybody's interested in that, that's going to be a fun exploration for you. So instead, what I thought I would do was to provide some hope. And what I mean by this is all of this research that we're doing to try to understand someone else's viewpoint and worldview, it's actually something that's important, not just in a way that distances and helps us adore uh, the uniqueness and holiness of God and, and distances him from, from other, I don't know, fallen ideas about who God might be. That's important. But also, what we need to do is to realize that becoming literate in someone else's story can help us build a bridge to this one. When I was a youth minister in Hendersonville, our youth group wanted to explore other religions, which I found a bit challenging to do at a Christian church. <laughs> so what we ended up doing was simulating missions encounters, where we pretended we were in different countries, and we explored some of the major religions around the world. And at the end of exploring those, we had a, a thought experiment called Walls and Bridges. And during this thought experiment, walls and bridges, we made walls. For example, if we were going to dialogue with Hinduism, Hinduism has a whole pantheon of deities, like a whole bunch of gods. We would draw a wall between Hinduism and Christianity in that reality, that Christianity is unanimously a singular god. God, the Father, the Spirit, the Son, a Trinitarian deity, there is one God, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. We hold to that, that there is actually only one living God. That would be a wall. A bridge would be a place where you could really admit some common ground. And I think some people get scared to do this, to think that, that there might be some common ground in our perspectives between Christianity and even something like Hinduism. Someone who did this incredibly well was a man you've heard of before. His name is Paul. And today I want to look at a scene where Paul is looking at other people's stories, like we've been doing, and he's finding the differences. And he's mourning those differences and the, and, and, and the way that, that, that these stories... And this, this view, this way of viewing reality, of uh, way of viewing God, uh, humanity, and the world around us has fallen. And, and he's finding that even they, uh, and we're talking about Athenian pagans, even they have something absolutely right. One more off-site video reference here. At a table talk we did here and. February of 2022, we explored this idea of seeing together that everybody has something to offer in the life of faith from their experience and that we need them to contribute to our view of the truth. Now, we as Christians believe that God has primarily revealed himself through his self-revelation that scriptures are his way of showing you precisely who he is in his relationships with humanity across a spectrum of, of time periods, cultures, and languages. That God is, in, in, this is a historical record of the unfolding of God's character as he desires to be known. And we believe in something called general revelation. This idea that God has revealed himself in a general way to everyone. There's a man by the name of Don Richardson who explores this in a wonderful book called Eternity in Their Hearts. It's chock full of stories of how God made himself known 
to people all around the world. And so what you'll find in there is these scraps of missionary journals that have been retold by him as a narrator, attempting to explore the common ground. That when these missionaries showed up in in uh, South America, where these missionaries showed up in the Norse countries, and these missionaries showed up all around the world in India, that some of the story of God was already on the hearts of the people. And so uh, this begins to challenge our, our ideas of how to engage in myth for the sake of mission. Because as, as much as we've been uh, poking at how uh, heartbreaking the view of the Babylonians are, there's actually a lot of common ground to work from. And if, if we have that kind of optimism, that kind of relentless desire, as we will see Paul do, to find the bridges, we may be able to find God at work already within the story of the audience we are attempting to reach. Isn't this amazing? So w without any further notice, let's tarry through this missionary scene of Paul wading into a conversation with the Athenians, but he does some homework first. And that's what we'll have to do if we're serious about conveying God among the nations. This is from Acts 17. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. And a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, What is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, He seems to be advocating for foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and carefully looked at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown god. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not very far away from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but he now commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, We want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, and also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Guys, do you realize what's happening here? This is incredible. Paul took the time to walk through and learn the stories of of those he was trying to reach, and he found an entry point, a bridge. He found this altar to an unknown God. And there's a story behind this that's really fascinating, and I don't have time to go into here, but let me just refer you to that book, Eternity in Their Hearts by Don Richardson. Give it a read. It's worth every word, and it's so encouraging. So let me tell you what Paul didn't say. Paul didn't walk in there 
invited as a guest, which is just an amazing opportunity for a missionary, he didn't say, <clears throat> you are bathed in godless stories that are both incompatible with the truth and alien to my God. Either you accept my predispositions or we must end dialogue right now because you don't bring anything to the table because all you offer comes from paganism. Because of your story origins, your myth, you can bring no truth to this conversation. That's not what Paul does. Paul says, in every way, you're very religious. He, he starts with an affirming word. He finds something nice to say. That's just good manners. But he doesn't stop there. He actually demonstrates that he has, get this, read their religious literature. That, that he's actually gone and, and, and made himself aware of some of the things that they think. And instead of completely wholesale bashing it, he obviously has some walls he sets up. He talks about not God not being made in, in an idle form, right? That, 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 that's a confrontation. He's setting up a wall there. But he's also affirming them. What's really fascinating is he's quoting a poet. That poet is writing a poem. His name is Eridus. This would have been a, a celebrated literary uh, figure for these religious Athenians. You see, he's quoting their religious literature. Eretus was writing to Zeus. And Paul is saying, hey, that, that little line he wrote here, you know, in him we move and have our being, that's right. I'm just, I'm just exclaiming that this is actually Yahweh, God of Israel. He thinks he's writing about Zeus, but he's writing about the Lord of heaven and earth who rose Jesus from the dead. He doesn't expect to find that this story is entirely new, that they know nothing about God. In fact, he finds things that they do know about God, affirms them, and then directs them toward the revelation of God through the story, the narrative of the scriptures of Jesus Christ. Do you hear what's happening here? Can you appreciate Paul's optimism that yes, while he's grieving their religious clutter, he is also finding deep truth to affirm and build a bridge towards and explaining the story of God. They're not wholly unfamiliar with God. Do you believe that about people you might be trying to reach, whether that's in our own neighborhood or around the world? Do you expect to find God in some form or fashion already at work in the stories of those you are speaking to? Paul challenges us to find hope that what is happening here is that God is already active and, 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 and the people who are made in the image of God, who, who have eternity in their hearts, while they are vastly confused and broken about who God is, they have something of him tucked away somewhere in their story, in their hearts and their minds. Paul is looking with such humility, such persistence, and such delicacy for that place where God is already making himself known and he's hoping to use that as an entry point in order to explain God as he presents himself in the scriptures and through the life of Jesus. Can we reframe our idea of proclaiming the gospel as, an, as a storytelling art? That, that what's happening here is that we are attempting to weave in to the story of God, those who are coming from other story places. Because ultimately, that's what the Bible does. That's what God is doing. That's what God has done, is that he has taken the whole of humanity, who he created, and is inviting them back into the particulars of his story as he reveals himself. So, how would that change conversations about sharing the gospel? if we expect it to find God at work in the stories of those we are reaching. With that question, let me just take three different application points from this story, this modeling that Paul puts forth. What do we want to do with the people we are attempting to reach? We need to learn their stories. We need to see God at work in them. We need to learn where their stories are compromised, fallen, broken, the stories they tell themselves, the story they tell others. But we also need to know where are they absolutely right. 
where do they see God already, even dimly, but somewhat clearly? Let's build from there. We create walls and bridges. If there's idolatry happening, as Paul is pointing it out, he names it. He's, you don't make this thing out of gold and silver. He's not made by human hands, guys. And so where are those places in the story of those around us that need a wall, a rebuke, a redirection? And where are the bridges? the places that actually the people were reaching. God is already at work and has partially made himself known in the hearts and minds and the stories of those who are reaching. We need to look with as much optimism as Paul. How on earth did Paul hope to find God at work already in this completely cluttered pagan place? And yet he did. Can we look that attentively at the stories, at the ideas, at the discourse of those we're trying to reach and try to find one two, three, who knows how many points of common ground that we actually share. Concerns that the Bible has. Oh my gosh, let me affirm that in you. And let me build a bridge. Because this story is for everybody. And it's the biggest and most beautiful story that's ever been told. And it's the truest. So we gotta build bridges. And the way we do that best, guys, I believe, is to know the story. This story, the Bible, I hope as we've, we've traced through the stories that the ancient Babylonians told and the stories that we tell ourselves today and we compare them to the story of the Bible. Is this the story that shapes our viewpoint of who we are, of what we're doing, where we're going, why we do it? Is this the predominant story of our lives? How well do you know the narrative of the Bible? The Bible Project has this wonderful video describing how the Bible as a as Jewish meditation literature. The, the stories in the Bible are, are supposed to shape us over a lifetime. And so the best way to do what Paul did and become cultural, culturally literate um, for the sake of mission is to root ourselves in the story of God and see all the beautiful threads that make this incredible tapestry of the story of God. You know, there's an image I've, I've used before in describing what the story of God is like, this idea of a photo mosaic, that each of the little bitty pictures that you get in scripture, sometimes we don't understand how to see them or what significance they hold. But when we zoom out like a photo mosaic does, there's a big picture that's clear and beautiful. How well do you know that big picture of the scriptures? May we sink into the story of God day after day, day and night, week after week, month after month, year after year, and be shaped by this story so that we can invite others into it. Guys, may we find God at work in the intersection of myth and mission. And may we realize, as Paul did, that there is indeed hope that God is already at work in the myths around us. Let's, like Paul, be missionaries of God's story and find him at work in those around us. Godspeed.